greetings to you this evening. In Jesus' name, it is good to be here with you again tonight. And I trust that as you were singing that song that has been the prayer of your heart, not only when we gather here, but through the day as well, as you think about those words, for God to have his way in each of our lives. It involves surrender to him and saying, here am I, Lord, use me as you would. I just want to take this opportunity to commend you parents of young children. I remember what it takes to get children ready for church and to get them here, especially on school nights. You have done very well. I want to bless you in that. Children are a blessing, a responsibility. We'll t- probably talk more about that Sunday morning. I want to bring a message on the family. But I have been encouraged as I see the next generation flourishing here at Myerstown. You have a, a great group of young children and something to be thankful for. So, so God bless you parents as you are in the thick of it busy days and a lot of activity going on. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making church a priority in your lives this week especially. Tonight I would like to share a message that I would entitle Sowing and Reaping. In our area we're privileged to live in a rural setting, an agricultural community, and it's not that different from what you are here. Sort of on the edge of town, but as as we travel in there's a lot of agriculture that happens and I think all of us are familiar with the action of planting or sowing in the spring we put out seeds and at this time of year we're looking more at the harvest end of things harvesting is happening around us the reaping we realize at this time of year the fruits of our labor now if you have any experience at all in agriculture you know that we can go through the same motions each year and have different results because ultimately we don't control every aspect of what happens in the agriculture and planting and the weather and all that. But as we think about the fall time and the harvest time, I want to think tonight together and consider the idea of sowing and reaping. The facts of sowing and reaping are facts that are applicable to all ages. And so tonight, while this isn't necessarily a children's meeting, it could be, I think whether you are old enough to hear and understand or whether you have been here for a long time and you're one of the oldest ones here, the message is for you, for each of us. I want us to listen up. We are sowing. If you're a youth-aged person tonight, pay attention. Tonight is not a time when you should sleep through the sermon. You are sowing. If you are a single adult, your days are filled with opportunities and choices. Be aware, you also are sowing. If you're a parent here, you especially are aware that your children are fertile soil. It is of utmost importance that you take care and be aware of what you are doing. You are sowing seeds as well. And maybe tonight you're a grandparent or or an elderly person. Know this, that the next generation is following in your footsteps. They're watching what you're doing. Be alert. Take heed. You are sowing, too. From the child who's old enough to listen tonight to the oldest adult here, the principle of sowing and reaping is real and applicable to each of us. Maybe you're here tonight, you've been a Christian for decades, or maybe you've just recently given your heart to Jesus and accepted him as your personal savior. The principle of sowing and reaping applies to us regardless of age, regardless of our experience and the length of time that we've been a Christian, it doesn't really matter. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There's no exemptions from that appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And while we often tend to think of the concept of sowing and reaping in the negative sense, we pay the consequences for sin or for foolish choices, I want us to be aware tonight that there is also a very positive aspect to this principle too. There's a blessing for sowing what is good and a warning against sowing what is evil or what is bad. This evening I want to look at six facts relating to the principle of sowing and reaping. And so I would invite you to turn to Galatians 6 tonight. I want to use these couple of verses here in Galatians 6 as a text for this message. Galatians 6, starting at verse 7 and reading through verse 9. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Just a short section of scripture, but loaded with the idea of sowing and reaping and some of the consequences and blessings of it. But the first fact that I want to look at tonight regarding sowing and reaping is the fact that we reap the same kind as we sow. We reap the same kind as we sow. This fact is established very early in Scripture. Turn, keep your finger here in Galatians 6, but turn back to Genesis chapter 1. And I want us to notice in some of these verses where this fact is established, the fact that we reap the same kind as we sow. Genesis 1, verse 11, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit, after his kind whose seed it is, is whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Down in the next verse, And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, And the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Down to verse 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Verses 24 and 25. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Did you notice a phrase in those verses that illustrates this fact, this principle? That phrase, after his kind or after their kind refers to the fact that every living thing produces something in the same image of itself. Now we know that, but I want us to think about that concept when it comes to sowing and reaping. God says here in his word in Galatians, God will not be mocked. We cannot expect to sow soybean seeds and reap watermelons. It doesn't work that way. You can never breed donkeys and expect to produce thoroughbred horses. You cannot sow evil and reap good. If you sow honesty, you will reap trust. If you sow humility, you will reap greatness. If you sow hard work, you will reap success. If you sow forgiveness, you will reap reconciliation. If you sow to the Spirit, you will reap life everlasting. But, those are positive things. But on the other side of that, if you sow selfishness, you will reap loneliness. If you sow pride, you will reap destruction. If you sow gossip, you will reap enemies. If you sow sin, you will reap guilt. And if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. We cannot sow discord and reap unity. We cannot sow sin and produce holiness. 
after his kind, the living thing produces. And children, tonight, when you sow disobedience, you will reap discipline. But when you sow obedience, you reap wisdom. Young people, when you sow rebellion, you will reap heartache. But when you sow respect, you will reap honor. I would encourage us to not be like Fred Allen who made this comment. He said, most of us spend the first six days of each week sowing wild oats. And then we go to church on Sunday and pray for a crop failure. Husbands and wives, when you sow infidelity, you will reap distrust and separation. But when you sow faithfulness, you reap intimacy and closeness. I believe that if someone would have told King David before his affair with Bathsheba that he was going to break every commandment on the second page, if you want to look at the Ten Commandments that way, every one of those last five, he would have declared up and down and denied that he would never do that. But think about what happened. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He committed adultery. He committed murder. He stole. And he bore false witness. The writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs 22 verse 8. In the New International Version says this. He who sows wickedness reaps trouble. It was true then, and it's true for us today. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I cannot state it too strongly. We reap the same kind as we sow. Someone has put it this way. Sow, an act, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, and reap a destiny. The second fact regarding sowing and reaping is this. We reap in a different season than we sow. We reap in a different season than we sow. Our text here tonight in Galatians says that in due season we shall reap. Now last week, one of the activities that I was doing on our farm was planting wheat, sowing wheat. I didn't expect to go out there and reap a harvest off of that this fall yet. It won't happen until next, probably early July. We don't reap in the same season. When I planted corn this spring, I didn't, again, expect that I was going to go out in two weeks and, and fill silo with what I had just planted. The harvest didn't happen until this fall. The harvest or reaping usually doesn't come immediately after sowing. And because we do not see the immediate results, we often think that we may have gotten away with something. But I want to tell you something we never do. We never do. Somehow, we seem to have the mentality sometimes that that's how it happens for everyone else, but I can do it and get away with it. It won't affect me the same way. There are seasons to life, and reaping is a different season than sowing. You carpenters know that you don't build a building in a day. Exercise doesn't produce muscles over one weekend, and wisdom isn't gained overnight. And there's a negative and a positive aspect to this fact as well. 1 Timothy 5, verses 24 and 25 says this, Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. You see that? The good and the bad, both there is a positive and negative aspect to this fact. It should be a warning to us against sowing evil. And it should be an encouragement for sowing good seed. Our text says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Sowing takes work. And I talked a little bit earlier to you as parents of young children, and I don't know that there's a better example of that, sowing. It takes work. It takes dedication. It takes consistency. And I'm sure if you're like we were, there's days you wonder, is anything sinking in? Am I getting anything across? And after a while, you might see, ha, I noticed something. He heard what I said. He didn't do it the same way he's usually doing it. He did it my way. Not that my way is so important, but you see things starting to take hold in their lives. And this fact is also evidenced by the reality that we sometimes reap what others have sown. Jesus spoke about that in John 4. He said this, herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. He's talking about the Samaritan woman there. But in our lives, there are times when we experience some of the harvest that others have sowed. We experience some of the reaping that others have sowed. Sometimes it's for good. You think about the, na- the nation, the country in which we live. We enjoy the benefits large of this free nation largely because of what people generations before us have done. You think about our church settings and the freedoms that we enjoy, the beliefs that we have, our non-resistant stand, and many other things. We take them for granted, but we are reaping some of the benefits of what generations ahead of us sowed. They in some cases, ended up giving their lives because they held these truths so dearly. And we are reaping some of those benefits. The same could be said in your family. I don't know all of your families that well. But I'm guessing at least some of us here tonight were brought up in homes that we had no choice of being born into. And yet we reap some of the benefits of our grandparents and great-grandparents who have made choices that led us to be in the setting in which we are tonight. But there's also a negative aspect to this. You think about our sinful nature. We have a sinful nature that we inherited because of Adam and his fallen falling there in the garden we had no choice in that and we reap some of the the consequences of Adam's sowing another one that we can think about is our national debt most of us here probably didn't contribute a million dollars to our great ballooning national debt and yet we reap some of the consequences of what those who have gone before have brought upon us. Another one is that God and his word have been taken out of our society in, in a large part. Most of us aren't personally responsible for that, and yet we reap some of the consequences of what others in previous generations have said, you know, it's not that important. We don't want that in our schools. We don't want that in our courtrooms and so forth. We reap some of those consequences. Too often, I believe we become impatient when our good sowing doesn't bring about immediate reaping and we tend to take matters into our own hands and say, God, you know, this is, I've done the good things, I've done what you wanted and I'm not seeing a result here so I'm going to take it into my own hands using our own strategies, our own wisdom. And we don't need to look any further than Abraham for this example. We are still reaping some of the heartache that Abraham sowed when he chose not to wait on God to provide his offspring through Sarah. The third fact regarding sowing and reaping is that we reap more than we sow. We reap more than we sow. 
Perhaps this is the most significant and sobering fact of sowing and reaping. When we reap or when we sow good things, we can expect to reap more than more good than we sowed. The harvest is always greater than the seed that was planted. As a farmer, if I only receive the same amount of seed that I planted, I would be on the losing end of a poor deal. I can plant a, seed, a bag of seed corn that will cover maybe two to three acres. And if I had to harvest two to three acres of corn just to, not, to get enough of kernels to fill that bag up in the fall, it would be foolish. What a waste of energy. But when I plant a kernel, a single kernel of corn, I can expect to get an ear that may have on it anywhere between 600 and 800 kernels. That's just one kernel. You look at the multiplication that happens in that. When I plant a soybean seed, a single soybean, I can expect to, on a good year, good conditions, sometimes have a plant that would produce between 100 to 150 additional soybean seeds on that plant. Reaping more than we sow is not just for farmers, though. It's true for every aspect of life both the physical and the spiritual. When we sow evil, we can, respect, we can expect to reap more than we sowed also. The prophet Hosea told Israel in Hosea 8, verse 7, they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. God's warning here is that you don't just reap the same kind that you sow, but you will reap much more. You sow the wind you'll reap a tornado. As a result of sowing the wind, Jacob and Rebekah's scheming to get Esau's blessing, they reaped the whirlwind. Jacob had to leave even though he got the blessing because Esau vowed to kill him when Isaac died. Rebekah told Jacob that he would only need to be gone for a few days and then she would send for him, but she never got to see him again because he was gone for over 20 years. Jacob tricked to get the blessing, but it backfired. He was tricked by Laban years later when he got Leah for his wife instead of Rachel. David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, sowed the wind. He sinned by sowing iniquity, and he reaped the whirlwind. He reaped trouble. Nathan the prophet, as he met with David and, real, and David realized that he was caught, Nathan said, you are the man, David. This is what he said. He said, you killed Uriah with the sword. The sword will never depart from your house. He said, you took his wife. You took Uriah's wife. Your wives will be taken before your very eyes. You did this secretly. Your wives will be defiled openly before all of Israel. You gave occasion to the, Lord, to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, and because of that, the child that is born to you will die. When it comes to sowing to the flesh, why is it that we think we can escape this fact, that we reap more than we sow? The songwriter has rightly said, Sin will take you farther than you want to go, slowly but wholly taking control. Sin will leave you longer than you want to stay, and sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. When it comes to sowing to the Spirit, though, may we be encouraged by this fact that a small seed that is sown will reap a bountiful harvest. Again, I quote a different songwriter who says this, does the place you're called to labor seem too small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it. The fourth fact regarding sowing and reaping is that we reap in proportion to what we sow. We reap in proportion to what we sow. I think back over the years that we've been farming, as, a, as you heard, I got started at a pretty early age. But I can remember 
30 years ago, when we planted corn, we aimed for a population of somewhere between 20 and 22,000 plants per acre. So that's how many seeds you put in the ground per acre. Today, on our farm, maybe it's different here in Lebanon County, I don't know, but we aim for closer to 30 to 35,000 plants per acre. And while hybrids have improved, we've also learned that to increase the planting rate up to a certain point also translates into a larger, more beneficial harvest and yield increase. This shouldn't surprise us. The Bible tells us that very thing. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Proverbs 11, <clears throat> verses 24 through 26, says, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 29, And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit eternal life, everlasting life. That's some bountiful sowing and reaping. Luke 6, verse 38, Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. When it comes to sowing to the Spirit, we don't sow bountifully that so that we can hoard all the harvest to ourselves, but rather we sow bountifully so that God receives the honor and the glory and others can receive a blessing. You see, there is a direct correlation to the amount of sowing we do and the amount of reaping that we will receive. Why is it sometimes that when we go about sowing, we, we tend to withhold our seed? Whether it's our talents or our money. Is it because we're afraid of a crop failure? Well, you know, if I knew it wasn't going to rain this summer, I wouldn't have planted so much corn. Is that how we think? Or are we just trying to be overly cautious? As Christians, I want to encourage us to remember that God promised while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Let's not be skimpy in our sowing. Let's not spare the seed so that we save money and save whatever it is we're trying to save. Let's be sowing bountifully. It does us no good to hold back on our energies, our zeal, our giving. We need to sow bountifully in good faith, trusting God to bring the increase. Bountiful sowing into the lives of our families, our marriages, our church, and our neighborhood. It takes work. It takes effort. We need to be intentional about it. But the bountiful reaping that we receive because of that makes all that effort, all that work worthwhile. And while we focus on the sowing to the spirit aspect of this fact, that we reap in proportion to what we sow, we dare not forget that this fact also applies to sowing to the flesh. If we sow abundantly to the flesh, we will reap an abundant harvest of consequences of fleshly living. The fifth fact regarding sowing and reaping is that we reap the full harvest of the good only if we persevere. The evil comes to harvest on its own. We reap the full harvest of the good only if we persevere. The evil comes to harvest on its own. In verse 9 of our text this evening, it says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
There's a condition there. We will reap if we faint not. Sowing is only a part of the process of reaping a good harvest. We need to persevere in tending to the seed that has been sown. Otherwise, the realization of a bountiful harvest may escape us, may not be realized. If you here have any experience in gardening, you know this fact. When you go about planting your garden in the spring, you prepare the soil, you make sure it's all ready to go, you plant the seeds, and then you walk away and pretend that when you come back several months later, you're going to have a a good crop of tomatoes or green beans or whatever it is that you planted, right? No, of course not. You know it takes perseverance. It takes diligence. You need to be out there weeding that garden, taking care of the plants, making sure there's enough water there, tending to it. If you do nothing, it doesn't mean nothing will grow. It means everything will grow, weeds and all. And so we need to be careful, make sure that we are being persevering, sticking at it, making sure that the weeds will be taken out. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells the parable of the men who sowed good seed and an enemy came along and planted tares. In Mark 4, the parable of the sower tells of various conditions which which adversely affect yields. Both of these parables, I believe, indicate this fact to us that there will be an opposition to our sowing to the Spirit. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1 says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. The idea here is that perseverance in sowing is needed. It's necessary. In fact, it may be that some of us may never see the reaping of some of our sowing in our lifetime. How does that make you feel? If you labor for something and you put all that energy into it, and you realize that I may never see some of the results of what I'm doing, does it give you cause to say, what's the point? I trust not. That's why Paul says here in verse 9, let us not be weary or don't be discouraged in your mind. He says you will reap if we faint not. or Don't lose your strength, spiritually speaking. You and I have an English Bible in our possession largely because of a man named John Wycliffe. He was known for producing the first English text of the Bible. He was quite a leader, and when he died, his enemies burned him at the stake and took the ashes of his body and sprinkled them over the Thames River in London. I can just imagine their thoughts as they were doing that. They thought, probably, forever we are rid of this Wycliffe guy but how wrong they were. Because the product of his labors, the English Bible is with us today because he stayed at the task. Wycliffe never saw the fruit of his sowing, but he persevered in faith, and today we enjoy the product of his labors. The sixth and final fact that I want to look at this evening regarding sowing and reaping is that we can't do anything about, I'm going to put it this way, about last year's harvest, but we can about this year's. Our lives are full of consequences we experience because of choices we've made or seeds that we have sown. How do we handle it when last year's harvest isn't so good because we fumbled the ball or because we dropped our part? Too often, I believe, we allow past failures to keep us from positive sowing today. There are two days in every week about which we should not worry. Two days which should be kept from fear and apprehension. One of these days is yesterday with its mistakes and cares, its aches and pains, its faults and blunders. Yesterday has passed forever beyond our control. All the money in the world cannot bring back yesterday. We can't undo a single act that we performed. We cannot erase a single word we said. Yesterday is gone. The other day 
that we should not worry about is tomorrow with its possible adversities, its burdens, its large promise, and poor performance. Tomorrow is beyond our immediate control. Tomorrow's sun will rise either in splendor or behind a mask of clouds, but it will rise. Until it does, we have no stake in tomorrow, for it is as yet unborn. And that leaves only one day, today. Any man, any woman, by the grace of God, can fight the battles of just one day. It's only when you and I add to the burdens of those two awful eternities, yesterday and tomorrow, that we break down. It's not the experience of today that drives men mad. It's remorse or bitterness for something which happened yesterday and the dread of what tomorrow may bring. And so my encouragement is that we journey but one day at a time. <clears throat> what we sowed last year, last month, last week, or even yesterday is done. There is no way that we can go back and retrieve or change what we did yesterday. Nothing we can do today will in any way change the record of what was sown yesterday or what will be reaped or the consequences of it. If we failed in our sowing, we cannot wallow in self-pity for having wasted an opportunity that was ours. If we have in if we have sown well, though, and we produced a good harvest and we're blessed by the harvest that we received, we can't just sit back and rest saying, ah, oh, I accomplished it. It's done. No, there's another season ahead and more sowing to be done. We cannot become complacent. We must confess our failures to God. If we confess our failures to him, the Bible tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us from all of those failures and to give us a clean slate. We need to rest in the fact that we are forgiven through Christ and move ahead regardless of our past. While we should never want to fail, the reality is that all of us do from time to time. And we need to use those failures as learning experiences, as stepping stones, so that we don't repeat those same kinds of failures. We need to learn from our failures so that we don't repeat them. But we must forget the past so that we can press on to the future with renewed commitment to God's word. Someone has put it this way, we cannot control the length of our life, but we can control its width and depth. We cannot control the contour of our countenance, but we can control its expression. We cannot control the other person's annoying habits, but we can do something about our own. We cannot control the distance our head is above the ground, but we can control the height of the contents that we feed into it. God help us to do something about what we can control and leave all else in his hands. Philippians 3 Verses 13 and 14, Paul says this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As I bring this message to a close this evening, I ask you this question. Children, what are you sowing tonight? Youth, what seeds are you sowing? Husbands, wives, in your marriage relationships, what kind of seeds are you sowing? Parents, what kind of seeds are you sowing into the lives of your children? Single adults and grandparents, what seeds are you sowing into the next generation that's coming behind you? What will the reaping be? What will the harvest be? be like. Remember, we reap the same kind as we sow. We reap in a different season than we sow. We reap more than we sow. We reap in proportion to what we sow. 
We reap the full harvest of the good only if we persevere. The evil comes to harvest on its own. And finally, remember that we can't do anything about last year's harvest, but we can about this coming year. We can do something about that because of what we have to sow. Hosea 10, verse 12 says this, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. (coughs) The psalmist said in Psalm 126, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. May those verses be an encouragement to us to be aware of what we're sowing, to make certain that we are sowing things that will bring about a harvest that will be to God's glory and to our blessing. Pardon me. I close with this. When it comes to sowing and reaping, guard your thoughts. They become words. Guard your words. They become actions. Guard your actions. They become habits. Guard your habits. They become character. Guard your character. It becomes your destiny. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you this evening realizing that our actions have consequences. And Lord, as we think about the reality of sowing and reaping tonight, I pray that each of us will consider carefully the things that we are sowing. As we look down the path of life and take into consideration the things we're sowing, And consider also what that harvest will look like. Lord, help us to sow good seeds. And Lord, as we think about maybe some of the seeds that we've sown in the past and the harvest that we have reaped or are reaping, we realize that you are a God who forgives, a God who heals, a God who restores. Lord, tonight, I pray for the person that's here tonight and maybe is saying, Why did I do those things? Lord, help them to find peace with you. Help them to learn from those mistakes and to move on. And Lord, maybe there's people here tonight who have experienced a bountiful harvest because of some very bountiful sowing. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. Bless their labors. Encourage them. May they be an encouragement to others. And may we all be encouraged and urged on to continue sowing for in due season we will reap if we do not faint Lord I pray you would go with us from this place as we go to our homes tonight we pray for safety according to your will give us a good day tomorrow a day of worshiping you a day of relating with one another and if it's not against your will that you would bring us back here again tomorrow evening for more of what you would have to say to us through your word. Dismiss us now with your blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming again tonight. Thank you for your attention, your prayers. Invite you back again tomorrow evening for our Saturday evening already. I'm not sure where the week is going. It's getting away from us, but I trust you will come praying and expecting God to speak to you. So God bless you as you go from here. If we have a closing song, then we'll consider yourselves dismissed. Children, don't forget to look for me at the back.